It's our regional municipal appeal public meeting with regards to the purpose of this meeting is to hold a public meeting pursuant to section 12 of the Development Charges Act 1997 to inform the public and to obtain their input with respect to the proposed region appeal development charges by law and background study. So we are going to start, Madam Clerk, we don't need roll call for this meeting. We're just going to open it up and I'm going to read the introduction accordingly. So I would like to call this public meeting to order. This meeting is now open and is being held pursuant to the Development Charges Act 1997 as amended. The purpose of the meeting is to present information to the public and to provide the public an opportunity to ask questions, provide comments and make presentations on the Regional Municipality Appeals proposed 2020 Development Charges Bylaw and Background Study. I remind uh, my colleagues that's rather firm in the legislation. It is our chance to listen, uh, not to ask or question. We get that opportunity, I believe, on November 26. The format of this morning's meeting will be to begin with a presentation and introductory remarks by Stephanie Nagel, Director of Corporate Finance and Treasurer, Adrian Smith, Director of Regional Planning and Growth Management and Chief Planner, and Gary Scanlon, Managing Partner and Director of Watson and Associate Economists Limited. Following this presentation, there will be an opportunity for persons and or the public bodies who are attending in person to make oral submissions on the matter or ask questions of staff. Staff will also accept any written submissions you may have and may wish to provide at this time in person or via email at council at peelregion.ca. For anyone who is attending in person and wishes to make comments, please register at the clerk's reception desk. For anyone who wishes to be notified of council's decision on the development charge bylaw, please register at the clerk's reception desk or send an email to regional.clerk at peelregion.ca. If you are interested in speaking on behalf of a special interest group, please identify the group prior to your speaking. So I need confirmation of notum, notice, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Notice of the public meeting was given in accordance with the Development Charges Act 1997 as amended by publication in the following news media having general circulation in the region of Peel. Mississauga News, September 17, 2020. Brampton Guardian, September 17, 2020. Caledon Enterprise, September 17, 2020. Caledon Citizen, September 17, 2020. In addition, the notice of public meeting was posted on the region's website as of September 17, 2020, and has been posted on the region's Twitter account several times between September 17, 2020 and today. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, at this time, I would like to emphasize that the proposed bylaw and background study are subject to change before being finalized by council. I now call on Stephanie Nagel, Adrian Smith, and Gary Scanlon to provide a brief presentation of the findings of the development charge background study and an overview of the bylaw adoption process. Over to you, folks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning to you, members of regional council and others attending this public meeting. Today, we're providing a presentation on the region's 2020 development charge background study and proposed development charge bylaw update. The presentation itself is, is fairly in-depth, and as noted, uh, Gary Scanlon, the managing partner and director at Watson Associates, will run through most of the detailed presentation. Uh, as noted, um, the chair introduced me, Stephanie Nagel. I'm the treasurer and director of corporate finance here at the region of Peel. And presenting with me, as we said, was Gary Scanlon and Adrian Smith, the regional chief planner and director of regional planning and growth management. Next slide, please. The public meeting will be presented in three parts. Following opening remarks from myself on the purpose of the public meeting, Adrian Smith will summarize the region's integrated approach to growth management in relation to this DC process. Mr. Smith's presentation will be followed by Gary Scanlon, who is the region's lead DC consultant. Mr. Scanlon will provide a DC overview and will present the region's proposed development charges and the proposed policies. Following this presentation from staff our and our consultant, there will be time for presentations from the public as well as questions from council. The process also allows for written submissions to be included in today's meeting. A submission was just received late yesterday from the Building Industry and Land Development Association, commonly known as BUILD, and which should be provided to council. As I will discuss later in the presentation, we have had extensive consultation with BUILD and we appreciate this ongoing dialogue. Staff, along with our consultants, will review the submission and respond accordingly. We do already have some additional meetings set up um, prior, uh, post this meeting to continue with the focus discussion. As we noted, these are proposed right now. Next slide, please. 
The public meeting purpose is, as the chair mentioned, is under Section 12 of the Development Charges Act 1997 as amended. The purpose of the meeting is to give an opportunity for questions from the public, provide comments, and make recommendations and presentations on the 2020 Development Charge Background Study and accompanying bylaw. The DC Act requires the following steps to be completed prior to the approval of the new DC bylaw. First, Council must hold a public meeting, which is being satisfied today. Secondly, the Development Charges Background Study must be released to the public at least 60 days before the passage of the final Development Charges bylaw and the draft development charges bylaw must be released to the public at least two weeks prior to the public meeting. As noted by the regional clerk, both the draft GC background study and the bylaw were made publicly available on the region's website on September 18th, and it is anticipated that council will be in a position to pass a new bylaw on November 26th. With that, I will turn it over to Adrian Smith, who will start with the next slide. So uh, thank you, Stephanie. And I'm going to provide uh, just some background about how the uh, uh, development charges bylaw update and the background study fit into the region's overall planning and growth management context. So back at the time of the last DC bylaw in about uh, 2015, the region initiated its current growth management program, uh, which includes a, a much more deliberate and integrated uh, uh, approach and collaborative approach to ensuring that the work underway related to planning and managing growth best delivers on overall outcomes such as providing communities for life and providing for financial sustainability. Uh, the growth management program includes uh, aspects such as the land use planning, the official plan policy, uh, growth allocation work uh, which was implementing and does continues to implement the provincial growth targets provided through Schedule 3 of the Growth Plan. It includes infrastructure master plans, and along with financial analysis, capital planning, DC background work, and all those pieces are carried out in a way that uh, each part of the work continuously informs and, and builds on, on each other piece, as we try to show, uh, to show on this slide. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the specific growth management activities and milestones leading up to today include um, the establishment of uh, local, municipal and industry working groups and forums for uh, getting real-time input and collaboration on our draft and emerging technical work around growth management. Um, included the testing of a number of growth scenarios and eventually council endorsement of a draft 2041 growth allocation, which provides uh, the basis to move forward with the region's infrastructure plans and, and the, uh, the 2020 DC background study. It included the preparation and approval of infrastructure master plans that Gary is going to speak to. And it included collaboration and input on, an, on a number of emerging land use and financial policy initiatives, including those some of those that, uh, that are incorporated in the DC background study. So the, the work is now turning to our 2051 growth targets. So overall growth management work is beginning to uh, look at that. And those 2051 growth targets were provided by the province in August. And they'll form the basis for our uh, update to the DC bylaw anticipated following our ongoing municipal comprehensive review that's underway. So with that bit of background on the growth management, I'll pass it over to Gary, who will uh, continue on with the next slide. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, pleasure to be before council once again. Um, I'm going to take the opportunity to um, review uh, some of the background on the uh, legislative changes that have occurred uh, since we last passed our bylaw in 2015, and then talk about uh, some of the calculations and some of the policy matters. Um, the slide that's before you right now just um, overviews the fact that we were the lead uh, in undertaking the study, but there were um, uh, a few other engineering firms which obviously were assisting in generating information, capital projects, et cetera. Uh, GM Blue Plan were um, uh, tasked with doing the water and the wastewater capital program. Uh, HDR uh, was working on uh, the transportation matters uh, in 2017 and additional work was provided by the IBI group with respect to the transportation works. Next slide. I think uh, this um, uh, timeline was well uh, reviewed by both Stephanie and Adrian. You can see the 2017 to 20 work was the point in time where we were updating the growth forecast and with that, looking at the engineering uh, information for water, wastewater and storm. And as we moved 
into um, uh, the end of 2019 and into 2020. We're updating things such as the growth forecast, um, the uh, uh, the rest of the services which are included, uh, reviewing policies, and then engaging with the uh, development community. As noted by Stephanie, uh, today, October 8th, is a mandatory public meeting, uh, and that must be undertaken prior to Council's consideration of the bylaw. And she also noted that uh, since the last time we passed the bylaw, there's been changes to the public process uh, made by the province to ensure that there's a minimum 60 days between the point where the uh, uh, background study is released to the public and the first day council could consider the bylaw. So as you can see, uh, the bylaw will be considered on November 26th, which is in excess of that 60 day period. And then we're looking to have the rates in effect for January 1st. Next slide, please. Um, this just summarizes, um, once again, the uh, the timeline. A couple of other matters that have been touched upon. Uh, in 2015, we uh, passed the bylaw and there were appeals to that uh, bylaw. We went forth to, um, uh, to the board. It was OMB at that point, subsequently made into the LPAT. Uh, it took over two years for us to actually get a decision from the board. Uh, so there were some adjustments that were um, provided by the board and we've been uh, considered those and for the most part embraced uh, the changes uh, suggested by the board. Next slide, please. Uh, development charges, uh, you've probably uh, understood this from, from prior presentations, is to recover the uh, infrastructure costs associated with new growth. And growth can uh, not only be on the residential side, but it also embraces the commercial, industrial, and institutional side. Um, the second bullet talks to the fact that the capital costs are in addition to what the developers normally pay as part of their development. Within, let's say, a, a subdivision, uh, the roads, the internal water mains, sewers, street lights, sidewalks, bicycle paths, et cetera, those internal costs are referred to uh, in the act as a local service. And with that, we have to define uh, what the responsibilities are for the more localized costs that developers will pay for 100%. And then it's outside of those costs that we then uh, start to consider um, uh, the projects that will be contained within the, um, uh, the development charge. Uh, if you're interested, if you look to our background study, Appendix E details that uh, local service policy. And we have had it before in the prior bylaws, but there's a change with uh, Bill 73, uh, which was put in place at the end of uh, 2015, which why requires us to be a little bit more granular and more express in defining what the uh, development community's uh, uh, responsibilities are. So I welcome you to take a look at your leisure at that particular uh, document. The next slide. <clears throat> in very simple terms, the development charges requires us to look uh, into the future and to forecast uh, uh, the amount, type, and location of growth. Uh, the type could be residential versus commercial, industrial, institutional. And then the amount may be defined over a 10-year planning horizon, which is what we looked at for the softer services. And then a longer period of time, up to 2041 for the water, wastewater, and storm. Uh, identify the, uh, the servicing needs and translate those servicing needs into actual capital projects. So then we have um, projects that represent dollar amounts. We must then make a number of deductions, grant subsidies and other contributions, if they're available. Um, consider whether any of the, pro uh, the projects are of a benefit to the existing community or the existing um, people. Normally we're considering whether we're overcoming a problem or such as uh, poor water uh, pressure in certain areas and certain improvements will improve that. So we consider um, for all the services, the potential of a, of a benefit to the existing. 
For the softer services, we have to um, take a look at a, a backwards 10 years, and the Act requires us to do this service standard calculation, which is really a mathematical cal calculation, which sets an upper limit on what we can uh, impose on uh, the development community. That's been undertaken. You can, uh, you're welcome to look at it in um, Appendix B to our report. And then we obviously need to rationalize reserve funds. You can see that item three on that list has a, has a, um, a stroke line through it. And historically, we were required to do a mandatory 10% deduction on the soft services. Um, with the recent legislative changes, that's been removed now, so we no longer have to do that calculation. However, I would note we released our um, background study on the same day that the legislative cha changes came into play. We released the study in the morning, legislative changes came into effect in the afternoon, so there was a little bit of a uh, uh, mismatch in our timing. But what we did do was to anticipate that that 10% deduction may be removed. And so if you look in Appendix G to the background study, we also did the calculations of the charges with that 10% removed. And that's what I'll be presenting um, today is the, the cost with those 10% uh, charges removed. After all of the deductions, we must split that net cost between a residential benefit, non-residential benefit, and basically divide it back through by the growth to come up with residential charges, which are represented on low, medium, and high density, and then a non-residential charge, commercial, industrial, institutional, which are represented on a cost per square foot. Next slide, please. I've talked uh, about uh, the local service policies a little bit. This was a requirement that was introduced by Bill 73 at the end of uh, 2015. Uh, just note, I just wanted to highlight it, and I've already mentioned that if you look to Appendix E, that localized responsibility of the developers is uh, expressed in that particular document. We go to the next slide. There, uh, the Act requires us to exempt certain types of development. So there's mandatory exemptions. There's not many, and for the most part, um, it's more intensification, per se, for uh, development. So if you've got industrial buildings, uh, not commercial or institutional, it's only industrial, you can expand that industrial building by up to 50% and not have to pay uh, a development charge on that expansion. Now we curtail that by saying you get a one-time expansion uh, opportunity up to 50%. After that, then um, there are, uh, you don't receive it. Otherwise, people will be staging their building permits to, to maximize the, um, this, this um, uh, potential credit and not have to pay the uh, charge. There's also intensification provisions for uh, low, medium, and high density developments. So if you've got an existing house, you can add up to two uh, additional units. And on medium, medium and high density uh, within those buildings, you can add an additional um, unit. So that's mandatory. That's in, in the Act. As well, there's the local uh, government sector exemption so that your bylaw cannot be imposed on the local municipalities or on the school boards and vice versa. Their bylaws can't be imposed on any building or structure you construct. The next section talks about discretionary exemptions. So the Act uh, anticipates that councils may want to make uh, discretionary types of exemptions to make the bylaw uh, a made in field region um, uh, policy. And you can reduce the charge partially or wholly for types of developments or specific developments. So a type would be um, uh, uh, like a place of worship, a class of development may be industrial. So you can target uh, certain types of reductions or exemptions. Uh, if the charge is going up considerably, you may consider phasing it in over time. And then lastly, there is um, uh, a redevelopment credit, uh, which uh, is contained within your bylaw, and I'll touch upon that in a moment, uh, that basically says if you're knocking down a building and you're gonna replace it, there should be a credit for what was there. And you have a certain period of time in order to, um, uh, to replace that building. 
So those are areas that um, we then work with staff and, and um, uh, once again, uh, express these to council and, and um, see if there's any other uh, refinements that might be required and we're incorporating those into the bylaw. If you look at the next slide, the current exemptions include hospitals, uh, university or college buildings, uh, buildings to structures owned by religious organizations, uh, basically bona fide farms, so um, agricultural um, uh, uh, barns and silos and associated buildings, and then mobile temporary homes. Um, so the next two um, uh, items talks about uh, adjustments to those current policies. One is to uh, adjust the agricultural definition so it does not include uh, cannabis, uh, either growing, processing, or packaging. Uh, most municipalities over the last five years have been turning their minds to, to this within that agricultural um, uh, definition and many uh, have been um, most are exempting the or sorry are charging for sure the processing and pack packaging and most are uh, um, charging the cannabis growing portion of the buildings so that's something that's there for council's consideration as well with respect to uh, religious organization space um, uh, identifying a, an adjustment so that uh, there would only be um, a 25 percent exemption with respect to those individual buildings on the next slide there's a, a, a minor adjustment to the definition of apartments right now the uh, stacked townhouses and back-to-back -back townhouses are in that medium density uh, category and what uh, we propose to do is to remove the stacked and actually put it into the um, uh, the apartment category in order to reflect the fact that um, they normally have a slightly lower occupancy, more in, in line with uh, apartments than um, with uh, medium density townhouses. Next slide, please. Demolition credit as well has been uh, refined. Um, we're looking to provide for residential developments. You um, get up to five years if you knock down your house or per se, if it burns down, yeah, you have up to five years to replace that, uh, that home. And if you replace it within that time period, we don't impose the charge. Four or five years is basically uh, what 95% of Ontario municipalities with DC bylaws provide. So this is consistent with most of uh, Ontario. Uh, with respect to non-residential buildings and structures, the credit being uh, recommended is 10 years. So if I knock down a strip mall and I'm gonna replace it with uh, another development, you have uh, 10 years to recognize what was there uh, prior to. <coughs> Excuse me, next slide. Um, I've talked about the legislative changes that we've seen since your last bylaw, and I just note them as uh, Bill 73, which was the Smart Growth for Our Communities Act, then Bill 108 and Bill 138, which was uh, with respect to more homes, more choice, and then lastly, uh, Bill 197, which is the COVID-19 Economic Recovery Act. On the next slides, next couple of slides, I'll just highlight some of the uh, changes. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> With respect to Bill 73, we talked about uh, the first one, chats that talks about refining that local service definition. Second one is uh, enhancing the transparency in the annual treasurer statement. Um, we had um, made this uh, recommendation to to the region uh, several years ago, so your, your current statements are in compliance with that. Make sure the background study is available 60 days prior to uh, when council can consider the passage of the bylaw, that's being met. There's commentary on asset management practices, and that's included in Appendix F to the report. Uh, one of the things they added, um, since 1997, solid waste as a service has been completely exempted as a service. And under Bill uh, 73, they added back in waste diversion. So recycle, re reuse, organics, 
all of that now is is eligible and we've considered that as part of the um, our calculations and the last one has commentary on area rating and we do have several instances where area rating is in place water and wastewater uh, don't apply to the rural areas. Um, you have two different types of OPP charges. Uh, sorry, police. You have a, a police in the south and an OPP in Caledon. So you have uh, several area rating charges. The next slide just summarizes um, Bill 108 and what, um, with respect to the development charge, what was put into place through that piece of legislation. It was introduced and then it was subsequently, subsequently refined and that's where we come through to um, uh, Bill 197. But <clears throat> what they did put in place under 108 was um, uh, uh, some relief in the timing of payment for rental housing and institutional development. So if you have a development coming through uh, that fit that category, you get uh, to pay that in, in six installments, one on the, the date you get your building permit, and then the anniversary, you'll make uh, your um, the anniversary of that payment over the next five years, you'll pay the, uh, the rest of your charges. For nonprofit housing, you pay over 21 installments first installment and then for the next 20 years uh, for nonprofit housing. Uh, interest may be charged on the installments and that was considered by council in uh, early July um, and put into place under um, bylaw 2120. And then lastly, the um, for uh, zoning uh, site plan and zoning amendment applications, um, the province has frozen the development charge as of the day you receive a completed application. So if I come in today with a complete application, whatever charges are in effect today are the rates that I will anticipate paying. And they uh, <clears throat> provide that uh, once you approve, once the municipality approves that site plan or uh, zoning uh, amendment, you then have two years to move uh, to proceed with your development uh, and that the rates continue to be frozen. If you go past that two year period, you now uh, can impose, the municipality can then impose the, uh, the rates uh, that are in effect of the day. So that came into effect under Bill 108. <clears throat> um, as well, um, the next slide summarizes um, the fact that there was also uh, a provision for when you're constructing a new unit, you can add an additional apartment in either a single detached, semi-detached, or a uh, townhouse unit. So I can add an apartment in this house that I'm building, and I don't have to pay a development charge on that apartment unit. So that's a new one which has been introduced as well. That will then basically provide a loss of revenue for the region for any of those um, additional units which are constructed. The next slide uh, just summarizes the Bill 197 provisions. There was, I would note, and you probably, um, uh, we had provided through staff uh, summaries of the, the different stages of um, um, the interaction with the, the province with respect to all of these changes. Um, they had anticipated eliminating a number of uh, municipal services, but at the end of the day, they there was only a select few that were removed. Uh, things such as municipal parking was removed and um, some aspects of um, uh, social services let's say Ontario Works related uh, buildings and vehicles. If you were charging for that, you can no longer charge it. For the most part, none of those will affect the, the region um, because the services we have continue to be what was in place before. Uh, so there may be further impacts on the local municipalities. Um, the second bullet talks about that mandatory 10% exemption. I spoke about that earlier. That has been removed for all of the soft services. And then the third one is they've introduced this um, community benefit charge. This is a charge which is under uh, section 37 of the Planning Act. Now I do know that um, Mississauga and Caledon 
have historically used this provision for high density units. It's, it, it's also referred to as bonus zoning uh, charges. Um, so they have made refinements to that so that they put rules that you can only impose it on buildings that are five stories or higher and those buildings must contain no less than 10 residential units. And if if uh, those developments meet it and the municipality passes a bylaw, you have to do a background uh, uh, evaluation. I guess you can call it a background study for the CBC. And if you have that, then you're limited to imposing up to 4% of the value of the market value of the lot the day before they start construction. So it's been contained to only 4% of the value of the land. And they've also restricted upper tier municipalities from being uh, uh, able to impose the charge. So all regional municipalities, uh, counties, uh, District of Muskoka have now been removed from being able to impose the charge. So either the local level municipalities uh, can utilize it or single tiers such as um, uh, Barrie or um, uh, Guelph or London, uh, they can use it, but uh, regional municipalities have been exempted from, from that charge. Next slide. Just quickly, the growth forecast, uh, Adrian uh, touched upon the process that you've uh, gone through. Right now, we've targeted out to 2041 for the longer term services, and we've done 10 years for the softer services. So over a 10 year planning horizon, we expect to grow by over 210,000 people, the longer term about 435,000. And that translates into about 80,000 units in the short term and almost 160,000 units over the longer term. And then with respect to non-residential uh, growth, commercial, industrial, institutional, we'd expect about uh, a little over $6 million in the shorter term and uh, approaching $13 million in the longer term. The next slide, uh, we wanted to point this uh, out uh, and this is data related specifically to uh, Peel region. And when we do development charges for the residential uh, sector, when we do the calculations, we actually bring everything down to a cost per capita. And then we take that cost per capita and we multiply it by the average number of people in the low density, medium density, and then the categories of apartments. <coughs> so this person per unit data, PPUs, is important in our calculations. And you can see that um, for the um, uh, 2015 versus 2020 uh, development charges that there have been adjustments. It was minor, it's a minor reduction actually in the, or sorry, minor increase in the single and semi-detached category, a slight reduction, 2% for townhouses, but then we have large and small apartments. So the large apartment has increased by about 20%, whereas the small apartments have uh, decreased by about 4%. Um, I know that uh, BUILD have highlighted this in their uh, the letter that they sent uh, to council, and we are discussing and we are going over the data with them, but probably the one of the biggest observations um, in, in explaining this change was the fact that in 2011, that was when uh, the federal government did the, um, uh, the census on a very limited basis. And the data that was coming out was, um, well, poor at best. And so when we take a look at what was there before and then this round census was quite robust and they did uh, uh, more, far more surveying and far more detailed analysis. And we can see the, uh, the persons per unit now that they have in place and we have a high level of confidence in, in that particular information. That is one of the reasons why you see such a significant increase in the large apartment uh, category. Uh, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to talk. Uh, the The final part of my uh, conversation is to to show you the charges for residential, and non residential, and then to provide you some, for some uh, comparative graphs across the uh, GTA. 
So this slide gives you the, um, the totality of the charges which we've calculated. Uh, the first uh, dark gray line summarizes the charges for uh, the harder services. So your water, wastewater, and, and um, roads, transportation, uh, or services related to highway, if you will. Those are the three main um, cost centers for your development charge. And you can see on a single detached, we're approaching $55,000 per unit. And then for the rest of the services, which is listed below, you can see it's approaching $6,000. So if we add the two of them together, the charge is approximately $61,000 uh, within Mississauga and um, uh, Brampton, and a slightly less charge in Caledon as a result of the OPP being charged separately. You can see it's uh, 60255 as we move across the uh, the columns, you can see other re residential is basically your medium density uh, types of units. So they come in in total at uh, a little over $48,000. Uh, and then we have the apartments, large and small. So a large apartment, approximately 44,000, and a small apartment, approximately $23,000. If we uh, compare those to the last time, and this is the next slide, your current bylaw, which was passed in 2015 and has been indexed every year, is currently for um, uh, all services, $53,500. And compare that to the calculations on the prior page, we're at just below $61,000. The big uh, increases, uh, uh, we saw some reductions in water and roads, but a significant increase in wastewater due to having to build additional uh, treatment facilities. Uh, and then there are probably uh, social housing is the other area. This has been uh, specifically embraced within the new legislation. We were charging a charge of about $800 per unit. That charge is now uh, just below 3,300. So those are the key areas where, where we've seen those uh, changes. On the next slide, uh, this is the comparison with respect to the apartments. And on the left-hand side is the large apartments. So uh, as of today, a large apartment would uh, pay about $33,000 and the proposed new charge is approximately $44,000. So there's about an uh, $11,000 adjustment in, in that particular unit. With respect to the smaller units, on that's on the right-hand side. You can see we're just below $22,000 currently, and we're just above $23,000 as the calculated charge. The next slide um, just gives you the, uh, uh, the calculated rates for industrial and commercial. Currently, your charge for industrial is lower and is calculated differently for transportation uh, than it is for commercial and institutional. So this reflects on this table those differences. So currently for industrial, um, your charge is $178 per square meter uh, of building space. And for commercial institutional, it's uh, 200, almost $231 for commercial institutional. If we go to the next slide, you can see a comparison. On the left-hand side is your industrial, and it's moving up from about $158 per square meter to 178. Uh, and then with respect to um, the um, commercial institutional, it's actually dropping marginally from 234 down to 231 per square meter. Last couple of slides are just to, for my wrap up, are just to show you some comparisons across the GTA. And if we can see the next slide, please. There you go. So this is your single detached units. Uh, the pinkish arrows are where your charges are currently today. The red arrows reflect the, um, the charges that I presented over the, um, the prior slides. And obviously, uh, there's uh, slight differences in the charges between the three local municipalities. Uh, that's why you have three arrows. So you can see currently you're on the left-hand side of the, um, of the graph. Uh, your charges at the highest end are within uh, Mississauga Area 1. 
but those charges are uh, lower than Vaughan, Markham, and King City. Uh, in Vaughan, uh, we, we're over $120,000 if you take out a single detached uh, building permit. And just to explain the colors on the graph, uh, the region and uh, upper tier municipalities are reflected in the uh, darker blue. Uh, the light gray is the uh, lower tier municipalities and the, the local municipalities, and then we have the, um, uh, that, that medium gray, which is the education. On the next slide, you can see the um, large apartments. Uh, and um, once again, we've moved up the, uh, the ladder, so to speak, uh, moving up to the left-hand side, and um, the new charges would put us just below Vaughan uh, and slightly above uh, Markham and King City. If we go to the next slide, the small units, those calculations put us just to the left of center. That's where you are currently, and with the updated charges, that's where you remain is basically just left of center. If you look at the, the ones that are on the left-hand side, it basically is all of York region um, on the left-hand side. Next slide just gives you our uh, commercial institutional charge, which we've called non-industrial. And you can see that your charges are basically on the right-hand side of the, um, of the graph. Uh, and you can see there was a, there was a $3 per cubic meter uh, reduction. And that's why you can see the red arrow, red arrows moving more to the right than where you are currently. On the next slide, your industrial charges basically are right in the center uh, of the municipality. Uh, on a cost per square meter, the highest charges are in Markham and Vaughan, and they're approaching $450 um, per square meter. Your charges, as we've talked about, are in the range of, uh, well, in this particular graph, if you add all of them together, at the highest level, we're about $285. Um, that completes my presentation, uh, Mr. Chair, and I'll hand it back to Stephanie to uh, finish up the presentation. Thank you, Gary. As part of the region's integrated approach to growth management, uh, oh, can you go to the next slide? Sorry. Thank you. As part of the region's integrated approach to growth management that Adrian spoke to earlier, staff leveraged the growth management program's collaborative structure as a platform to work with the key stakeholders on all matters relating to planning, growth management, infrastructure planning, and finance. Meetings have been held throughout 2020 with the Building Industry and Land Development Association. These meetings are shown on the timeline above with the reference to the key topic of each meeting. All meetings included the lead consultants for BUILD as we discussed the DC background materials. These meetings resulted in constructive discussions towards the development of the DC policies and technical aspects of the draft calculations. Since the release of the background, draft background study on September 18th, we've had one consultation with BUILD and their consultants and an additional engagement meeting with BUILD Peel chapter members on October 5th. Next slide, please. Thank you. The engagement with the development community will be ongoing and continuous to support the management of growth in, within the region. Since the release of the draft background study, consultation meetings with the industry remain ongoing, and we look forward to continuing the constructive discussions towards finalizing the region's DC bylaw. The feedback received from the public and the development community will be carefully considered in the preparation of the final 2020 DC bylaw. It is anticipated that Council will be in a position to pass the 2020 Development Charge Bylaw on November 26th. The final Development Charge Bylaw is expected to come into force on January 1st, 2021. As a final note, our current 2015 bylaw is set to expire on January 24th, 2021. The intent is for that to be repealed with the effective new bylaw on Jan 1. Next slide, please. This concludes the staff portion of this public meeting. Contact information has been provided to assist with further questions or submissions of comments. I will now turn the meeting back over to the chair for the next steps in the agenda for this process. Thank you, um, and thank you, Gary, for such a fulsome presentation for our council. Yes, thank you to all for an excellent presentation. That brings us to the public participation component. 
I request that all persons wishing to address the proposal or ask questions make representation through the chair. Are there any persons present who wish to make an oral submission? And I see the council chamber is empty, so I'm assuming the answer is no to that. But perhaps there may be some virtual oral submissions at this time. So through to the clerk and our support staff, are we aware of anyone who wishes to make a virtual presentation? And I'm being told there is no one. So with that, I will acknowledge the one written submission that we do have. It's from Jennifer Jarasek, planning, uh, sorry, Planner for Policy and Advocacy Bill, letter dated October 7, 2020, regarding the Regional Appeal Development Charges Review for the public meeting. So to date, we have received one written submission regarding the proposed bylaw and background study. And last call for any other written submissions. This would be your opportunity to do so. So with that, we come to the end. I want to thank all the speakers for your interest and representations during the meeting and, and from before as well. The comments expect that this meeting will be taken into consideration and a final report and supporting bylaw will be considered by Regional Council on November 26, 2020. This brings to a conclusion the public meeting regarding 2020 development charges bylaw held under the Development Charges Act 1997 and I hereby declare the public meeting officially closed. We stand adjourned and that takes us into our council.